There's an old saying, give the people what they want. You guys certainly want more Thomas Sowell. So here's one from the VHS archives. Uh, Roger Ailes conducted this interview with Thomas Sowell about the book, The Vision of the Anointed. This book certainly was one of the ones that opened my eyes to the thinking of Thomas Sowell. It's a great book. And in the description, I have a link so you can listen to the audiobook version as well. Um, check out this interview. I hope you like it. Leave me a comment, like, share, subscribe, all those good things. And here we go. In addition to a long list of popular and learned writings, Thomas Sowell writes a syndicated column and a bi-weekly column for Forbes. His latest book, The Vision of the Anointed, presents a devastating critique of what he considers the failed social policies of the last 30 years. Economist, social critic, author, Thomas Sowell. Tom, good to see you. Good seeing you. How are you? Pretty good. Um, how would you be as president? I just I made that up because I, I love your writing and I love the way you think. Would you be a good president? Probably not. I'd probably get impeached because I would go ahead and <laughs> do whatever I thought. do some of this stuff, right? Do what I think is right and uh, those who didn't think it was right would uh, do otherwise. Well, you're a former, I heard you were in the Marine Corps. Yes. So you must have decision-making ability as well, right? Well, I've made decisions, if that's what you're reading. <laughs> what would you do first as president? Oh, my gosh. Oh, you, you wouldn't There's know so many, you wouldn't know where to start. Is yes. That it? It's like the old story of the, 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 the mosquito in the nudist colony. There's so much <laughs> there, you don't know where to start. <laughs> All right, the, the vision of the anointed. Now, mm. that's, a, that's an interesting title. Who are the anointed? They are the elite in the media, in, the, in politics, uh, all of those who think that third parties ought to be making people's decisions for them. The subtitle is self-congratulation as a basis for social policy. In other words, people who think that everything that's wrong with the, the country is due to the fact that other people are just not as smart as they are. And if only they could, you know, or people like them could take over and make our decisions, we'd be so much better off. But in, the early, in early America, didn't this sort of educated class make the decisions for everybody? As far as governmental decisions, yeah. but the government itself didn't make uh, the decisions for everyone. Uh -huh. Now, uh, you know, you, you can't decide where your kid's are going to school. You can't decide whether or not they can move a, a halfway house for drug, for drug users next door to you or whatnot. It's out but, of your control. The government that, decides that's that That's right. Stuff. The government decides too many things. They decide also how your children will be raised. Uh, you may have an idea about how, at what age children should be introduced to sex and in what manner, with what kind of moral commitment. You mean so as on. a parent? You as have a this parent. A parent, yes. Uh, the schools have taken that over. By the time you even think about it, they've already had years, you know, of showing... They're passing out condoms to these kids. Passing even before out condoms you... is not, not even the half of it. Uh, they're, they're showing uh, motion pictures of naked couples engaging in sex, both homosexual and heterosexual, in the seventh grade. And if you complain about it, that's, that's considered to be censorship. You don't, you, you can't pull your kid out of school and say they don't have to put up with this stuff? I guess you could, no. but you'd be... Uh... Well, if you have a private school to put him in, but you have compulsory attendance laws, and if you don't have the money for private schools, then you're stuck. Where did this country get off the track and decide that the federal government should make most of our decisions? Well, it started to some extent in the New Deal, but I think the 1960s is sort of the golden age, if you want to put it that way, of this whole mindset. And that's what the book's about. It's about a mindset. It's not about a series of policies but of showing how in policy after policy, those who think a certain way will uh, try to take over other people's decisions. How do you characterize the liberal philosophy today from the conservative philosophy? Oh, that's a tough one. Uh, I guess the main thing about the liberals, again, is that they think a program will do it. If there's something that they don't like in the society, you have set up a program and that will solve the problem. Uh, I think one of the things that, one of the words they use a lot is solutions. And I argue here and elsewhere that there are no, there are no solutions. There are just trade-offs. So, for example, when uh, Ralph Nader launched his attack against the Corvair many years ago, he said it's an unsafe car and it does the, has these safety problems and those safety problems. And in some respects, the, uh, he was correct, not all. Uh, but the fact is, there were other things that a Corvair would do that made it safer than other cars. Uh, and on net balance, it was as safe as the rest of them. Are you saying there are no solutions to our problems as Americans? There are no solutions to anybody's problems. There are trade-offs. You know. Um, Safety is a classic example. Uh, every, every, every year, so many hundreds of thousands of people are uh, vaccinated against uh, measles, smallpox, those kinds of things. Now, this saves an several hundred lives that it's estimated. It also causes brain damage to about 30 kids a year. Now, there are no solutions in that. There are just trade-offs. What about but, crime? Take crime as an issue. Can we solve 
the crime issue or fundamentally solve it so it's reduced? Well, then that, that's, just, that, that's, that's, that's a trade-off. You, know, you, know, you, don't, you don't solve it. There will always be crime. There always has been. Uh, but you want to keep it down to some level that's not this astronomical thing we have today. Uh, for example, the people, the, the liberals right now are saying, you know, crime has eased off uh, in New York, and that's true. Uh, there, were, there were six times as much crime in New York a few years ago as there was in 1960. Now it's down to five times as much crime as there was in 1960. Now, that's not what I regard as a great, as a great, as a great trend, unless it continues a lot, a lot, a lot more sharply. Well, liberals think we need more education, and we need to help people in the inner city more to cut down crime there. Uh, Conservatives would say we have to be tougher on crime. Is either of them correct? Oh, I, I, I no. See, you see, the conservative view is really not a not a solution. It's a it's a trade off. It says yes, it would be wonderful if we could do all these things to prevent crime in the first place. We just don't happen to be that smart. And so what we do, we put people behind bars who commit violent crimes. Now, a few years ago in East Palo Alto, which is not far from Stanford University, a minority community, low income, they had the doubtful distinction of being the murder capital of the United States in proportion to their population. Uh, the next year, murder and all sorts of other violent crimes dropped tremendous amount, 30, 40, 50 percent in one year. Now, that wasn't because they discovered the root causes of crime or because they worked out everything that was wonderful. They launched a campaign that put a lot of the bad guys behind bars. And when they were behind bars, they didn't commit as many crimes. <laughs> that uh, makes sense to me. And, and the thing that this, 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 this model, you know, even in a high crime area, the great majority of the people are not criminals. And so if you can just put your hands on those people who are raising all the, all the hell in the community and take them out of circulation, the crime rate drops. People say there's undue uh, emphasis on African Americans for committing crimes. Is that true? Uh, Ed Koch I wrote in a column here that the population is 25 percent African American in New York. 62 percent of the crimes are committed by African Americans. Is that a? And he says I haven't I haven't checked his figures, but but yeah, throughout the world, this is this is this is not not unusual. Throughout the world, people are disproportionately represented in all kinds of different things, and it's true, obviously, in basketball. It's true in all kinds of other things. Uh, the main thing is not is not to keep people out of jail because they're one race or another, because when you do that, the people who are going to suffer the most will be the black community. Where are you on affirmative action? Against. Why? Well, you can only do one of two things. You can either just uh, judge people individually or you can judge them by groups. This whole notion that you're going to come out with a compromise, I would defy anybody to come out with a compromise on that. You're going to do one of those two things. Now, you can pretend to be doing other things, but that's all you're going to do. That's, those are the only two choices you really have in the end. Uh, again, the people who are the anointed think of this as a symbolic issue, and they want to be on the side of the angels. They don't ask, what are the consequences? Now, I've studied affirmative action programs around the world. One of the consequences is that those people who are more fortunate in the group that has the preferences, those people take the lion's share of the preferences. Very often, those at the other end of the scale, the poorer people, uh, actually fall further behind. That's true of black share. It's true of Malays in Malaysia. It's true of various groups in India. And there are reasons for that. Uh, you know, you, you can say you must have certain proportions. Nothing is easier than for an employer who, would, who might otherwise locate, let's say, in the Bronx, to locate out in Provo, Utah, where he will be not near any black people, and therefore he will never have lawsuits, and the jobs will be in Provo, and people will wonder why don't people, you know, uh, here have more jobs. Uh, it never seems to occur to liberals that other people are not blocks of wood. That when you set up certain incentives, they will react to them in certain ways. And when they do that, the result may be the opposite of what you set out to do. People uh, say, will probably say, this guy's conservative. He must have come from a rich family. He must have come from a rich background. What's your background? Well, I, ca I came out of Harlem. Uh, in fact, I was, uh, uh, I remember when I, I, grew, I, I grew up in the, first in the South. And I can remember uh, one of my relatives taking me to a place where she worked as a maid. And I remember seeing the two faucets there, and I said, gee, they must drink a lot of water here. <laughs> and she said, no, no, the, one, of them, one of them has hot water coming out. I thought it was wild, because I, I'd never seen anything like that. Is that right? Yeah. Did you feel discrimination during those days? I was just a kid of eight. Yeah. I lived in the black community. Uh, we saw, I, it came as a shock to me to discover that most of the people in the country were white. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how come more conservative, how, more, more blacks aren't conservative? More are becoming so. I, I think, I, I, think, I, think a, I think a good part of it goes back to the days of the civil rights movement, mm -hmm. that many of the conservative Republicans uh, came down on the wrong side for all sorts of political reasons, uh, and I think they, they, they're getting the, the fallout from that 
for decades later. Yeah. At some point in time, however, you have to say, no, there's been a complete turnover uh, in, all, in both parties. And now we have to talk about today's issues with today's people. All right, I got to take a break here. We're going to go to a commercial. We're right back. Economist, social critic, and author. Here's the book, The Vision of the Anointed. We're going to talk more about this. You know, the anointed are those uh, elites we talk about all the time. Uh, we'll be right back. Stay with us. Vision of the anointed, the vision of the anointed. Uh, how do the anointed refer to people they don't agree with? All sorts of ways, but I think the main thing is they believe that uh, you're not merely in error but in sin. In other words, they can't believe that you're just mistaken. Uh, you, must have, uh, you must have sold out. You must have, uh, must be something warped about you. Do people uh, think you sold out because you're conservative? Oh, some do. Some do. do. I, I'm always fascinated with that phrase. I first time I heard it was at Cornell University, and uh, and I attacked the president of Cornell University on the front page of the New York Times. I wanted now if I'm selling out, who am I selling out to? If I'm attacking the <laughs> president of Cornell University, <laughs> what brownie points will I get for that as an assistant professor on a three-year contract? Yeah, that's not good. Yeah. No, no. And the the other thing that always gets me is that uh, the people who are supposed to have sold out typically have less money than the ones who are making the accusations. Uh, years That's ago, always true. I, I remember some student wrote to me and I said, what, what you need to do is make a list of all the blacks on your campus that you think have sold out. And then make a list of those you think you have stood up for the right thing, you see. And then alongside each name, put down the name and, and model of car that they drive. And then see if you want to reconsider what you've just said. But, you know, when, when the liberals don't agree with, with people, they, they classify them as... Uh, mean-spirited. Oh, yes. Uh, for the rich. Let me give you some classic liberal comments about conservatives. Mm. You guys are for the rich. Mm. You guys only care about the rich guys. Mm. Uh, answer that. How do, you, how do you respond? Liberal says conservatives only care about rich people. Well, one of the things I go into in the book is that the whole notion of rich is ridiculous. Uh, that most Americans don't stay in the same income bracket, even for one decade. So the same guy who is, quote, rich now was 20 years ago, probably in the bottom 20%. I mean, I was on a cruise recently, a luxury cruise, and the guy said, you know, if so someone had told me when I was growing up that I would end up on a cruise like this, I would have said, get real, man. You know, that uh, very few people are in that same income bracket the whole time. Right. The genuinely rich and the genuinely poor, I would estimate to be no more than 3% of the American people. Really? Put together. Really? Yes. Genuinely poor. Now, they, I'm seeing numbers like... When they were talking about health care, they said, uh, what, 30, 20, 30 million people couldn't afford it or something? That's a uh, several million of those were making more than $50,000 a year. So it's not, see, this is one of the things the anointed do. They never believe that people make choices. There are people who, make, who have the money, they, they prefer to put that money into a BMW rather than have rather into A lot of young people didn't want health care. They, they were betting on their health. Uh, absolutely. And yeah. then this allows them to buy more stuff they want to buy. So it's not a question that they couldn't afford it. It's a question they don't choose to spend the money. What about uh, mean-spirited? Conservatives are mean-spirited. They're, they're bigots. They don't like people. Well, you know, one of the things I, I, I tell people, people say, you know, you're, you're, you're a very uh, tough person. I, I'm not tough. Life is tough. I'm merely trying to acquaint you with, the, with those facts. What kind of a father were you? Tough? Well, now, I've never done a, done a uh, poll among my children, <laughs> uh, fortunately, probably. <laughs> but I have, I have been called the last of the Victorian parents. Oh, really? Yes. Uh, I, I am not one who believes that the kids should be given on unlimited indulgence, and I think I can safely say that mine were not. Were you too tough? I mean, in other words, did they rebel? Don't kids go through a rebellious period? How did you deal with that? Oh, I, I, don't, I don't know. Uh, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I just... Uh, uh, Said, here's what you should do, and... That's it. When, when, when the kid's away in college and he's not doing any... Doing, and he's messing up, I simply say there'll be no more money. <laughs> and that's then, good. Yes. It sort of it gets, gets their, their attention. attention. Yeah, absolutely. Right. absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, back in the 60s, Lyndon Johnson announced a war on poverty. Mm. Am I wrong, but there are more poor people. I mean, in other words... Today than they were then, yes. Yeah, there are more poor people. Yes. I mean, this was a hell of a war. We lost it, apparently, because for the last 30 years, we've been dumping money into these poverty programs. Oh, absolutely. Where does the money go? Oh, it, it, it supports a whole industry of people who uh, run those programs, who talk about those programs, research those programs, bureaucrats, and so on. Doesn't help poor people. No. I went to Harlem in the 60s when John Lindsay was 
mayor mm. of New York, and, hey, there's some things needed fixed, and they mm. talked about fixing them, and so everybody voted for these programs. So you go up there today, you've got the same problem. Oh, yeah. You've got them worse than most places. Uh, the tragedy you see is that the anointed really want to make symbolic statements. And running these programs makes those symbolic statements. They don't really care if in the, in the wake of affirmative action, for example, companies start locating away from minority communities so they don't even get involved in, in legal action. They don't care about that. They've made their statement on the side of the angels, and that's what's important. Have you ever debated Jesse Jackson? No, I haven't. Is that because, would you like to, or would he not want to do that? I have no idea. I have no idea. Uh, I've You'd seen be willing to, I assume. Oh, I, it, maybe. I don't, I don't know. Uh, you think that's too much showbiz? It is. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a, there are people who go out and do this, and I, I'm doing less and less of it. And I tell them the story of an, of an African uh, boxing champion who fought an Irishman in St. Patrick's Day, Day in Dublin. And he lost his title on what the sports writers called a questionable decision. <laughs> 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 yes. And so you have to know what forum you're talking about. Right. I, was, I, was, I saw Shelby Steele on with him, and I said, you know, if Jesse Jackson and Shelby Steele each had to present a two-hour lecture to an audience with an average IQ of 120, Shelby would wipe him out. But if they had five seconds each on Donahue, it would be Jesse Jackson all the way. Right. So everything depends upon the forum. Uh, is Jesse Jackson good for African Americans or no, not? He's, he's not. good for himself. Good for himself. And that's true of most ethnic leaders in most groups in most countries in most periods of history. That what will make, what will serve his interest is to keep people paranoid, dependent upon him, dependent upon government. What will serve their interest is typically just the opposite. Whew. That's pretty interesting. So you're saying that the, the leaders, whatever group, yeah. whatever yeah. leader, wants the people to be poor and dependent on them as opposed to dependent on themselves. Oh, absolutely. And I, I, you see this in the greatest cynicism in the academic world, where in many places, uh, black uh, organizations on campus have a say on who gets admitted. And they have turned down blacks with excellent credentials, both as students and as faculty members, uh, for that very reason. All right, got to take a break again. Thomas Sowell will be right back. We're talking about the vision of the anointed. Pick it up. Well, I'll tell you, if you want to know what's going on in this country, this guy knows. Stay with us. Talking with Thomas Sowell. Uh, lots of talk about Colin Powell now running for president, and uh, nobody can quite figure out what he stands for, although there have been some hints in this latest uh, book, this new book of his, that suggest that he might be a social liberal and a fiscal conservative. Uh, have you been able to read between the lines? What are you reading, Colin? No, Powell? My, my, my eyesight is not that uh, super keen to yeah. figure out what, he, what, what he's saying. I think it is uh, sort of a watershed in the history of the country, though, that the only man who's been uh, uh, level with the president in the polls has been a black man. Yeah. I think 30 years ago that would have been not conceivable. Um, and I think it's interesting that very few people seem to want to look at the implications of that. What do you think it means? I mean, I think that uh, Colin Powell, I know Colin Powell, and I, 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 you know, he just has tremendous leadership appeal. Mm -hmm. and there's a sense, I mean, you don't get to be head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff unless you've got some leadership mm -hmm. ability. Uh, but there's a sense that he might be, or a hope or a wish that he might be above politics is the reason. I think, I, I think part, part, partly that, but I think, too, too, I think it's a commentary on the people who are professional politicians, that they say, you know, uh, this guy is not in politics. Uh, that already gives him a big boost. Um, I, 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 obviously, before he can ever run, he's going to have to come out with some positions. But I do think it's very, very useful to think in terms of uh, what this means in terms of the public. Uh, that is the what what is what it's saying is that the Mark Fremans are not the norm. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, he's not up for anything. I don't think he's going to get elected to anything. No, Mark not, Furman. Not, no, not not anytime <laughs> no, soon. No. Uh, do you think if Colin Powell runs as an independent or as a third party candidate, he would have a chance? I mean, are we at that point in America where there's a disappointment in the Republican and Democrat Party enough to elect? A third party? A third party? Well, I think what Perot did last year was remarkable. And, he got 19%. Uh, 19, 19%. But he got 19% after a lot of uh, fiascos. Imagine if he'd handled it uh, better, what, what he might have gotten. Mm, yeah. um, I, I, in a sense, I think it would be more tragic if a third party candidate won because he wouldn't have no uh, party in Congress. Yeah, he'd have, he'd have no support in Congress. He'd, have, yeah. he'd be fighting everybody in Congress. That's, That's right. been traditionally the problem with independent governors. They don't have any support in the legislature. Uh, yeah. Um, if uh, on the on the Republican side, who do you see philosophically that you think would be the opposite of a Bill Clinton? Can you tell? Oh, Phil Graham. Phil Graham. Yeah. Do you support Graham? Yeah. 
You do. Um, I think Bob Dole would makes, makes a great majority leader in the Senate, and I think that would be, that would be a good role for him uh, if someone came in. But I think that the situation in the country has reached a point where so many things have gone so badly. I mean, education, morals, uh, the, just the up and down the line, that what you're going to need is a good two terms of someone dedicated to turning the whole thing around. Uh, and that has not been the role that uh, Senator Dole has played. Uh, you know, it's like, take a tri trivial example, a national endowment. Uh, you know, it doesn't do any good to cut back the national endowment because they're going to lay low until times get better politically and they'll come right back again like crabgrass. Mm -hmm. You've got to root them out. And I have the feeling that uh, Senator Dole is the kind of person who runs the lawnmower over the crabgrass and it looks good enough for now, but that isn't solving the problem. Phil Graham doesn't seem to be able to get the press to... Uh to uh, say that he's anything except sort of a mean-spirited person. Well, they, 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 use, they use the word mean every time they, they uh, in other words, they're trying to condition us like Pavlov's dog. So when we see Phil Graham, we think mean. But uh, whether that will work in the long run, uh, you know, it's a long way to... Uh, to he's to a charming, next... actually funny guy. He's been a guest on this show, and mm -hmm. I know him quite well, and he's he's a pretty funny guy. But, but uh, you know, I, I'm old enough to remember uh, front-runner Ed Muskie. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, and overnight he was out of here. Yeah. Uh, Gary Hart was doing pretty well at one time. One time, uh, um, who was the guy from Massachusetts, uh, ran for the president? Oh, yeah, Michael Dukakis. Yes. I remember that 20 guy. 20 points yeah. ahead of uh, Bush. Yeah, and then he, uh, uh, yeah. So, so what, what things look like right now don't really tell you everything. Yeah. Uh, do you think, what do you think the chances are of Clinton getting reelected, though? He seems to be holding steady at about what he got. He needs an independent candidate. Yes, um, that, that, that'll help him a lot. Uh, I think his chances are dangerously high. Mm -hmm. uh, and dangerously in the sense that not only would he be as bad in the second term as, as in the first term, but worse, because in the first term, whenever he tried to go far left and things went bad against him, he would dump the can people like right, Lonnie Guinea. Right. He did and everything. People, he'd yeah. dump them, you see. Right. But in the second term, he wouldn't have to do that because he has nothing at stake anymore, and he could load the place up with people of that sort. The people around him are clearly the anointed. I mean, you hear Robert Reich talking about how he's going to rebuild the labor force as if he were a carpenter and they were just pieces of wood. Right. You know, when you talk about reinventing government and all this kind of high-flown nonsense, uh, those are the people he surrounded himself with traditionally, and we'd get a lot more of them on the federal bench where they'd be there decades after he's gone. You know, it's amazing. You've had so much education, and yet a lot of the anointed are the educated types, the ones who've been college professors, right? That's true. Typically in, in the non-scientific areas. Socials. Uh, social oh, sociology, history, uh, humanities, heaven help us. Yeah. Uh, who are the mascots of the anointed? You talk about the mascots of the anointed. They're people whom, whom they choose to um, back and whose rights are supposed to override other people's rights. The homeless are a classic example. Uh, I'm, I'm appalled when I see people out there in the street uh, uh, giving money to, to the home. I'm mean, able-bodied men. I, yeah. I think one of the classic pictures to me uh, was in San Francisco when there was this uh, able-bodied white man out in the street begging, and there's this black lady coming along there, uh, very modestly dressed like she didn't have, but she's stopping to open her purse to give him some money, you know. And I thought, good heavens, have we really come to this? And we've been brainwashed by the anointed into thinking this is what we ought to do. What do you say to guys who bum money off of you? Not all of it can be repeated on, on, on the air, <laughs> but the fact is they don't get any money. They don't. And, I, and people who complain now about all these people begging in the street, as a simple answer, don't give them money and they won't be in the street. But isn't that hard-hearted? And as a conservative, doesn't that make you a cruel, hard-hearted, uh, well, non-compassionate I'm, I'm, person? I'm, I'm, I'm depriving them of their booze and drugs. That's really what you believe? Yes. Now, would you help somebody if you knew it was going for food? Yeah, in fact, in fact, I must confess that just recently I, I did have, give out some money to an elderly lady uh, in St. Petersburg, Russia, because I'm told that they've been devastated by the fact that their pensions have been uh, ruined by the inflation that they've had over there. And so I, there are people, you know, like that. But, uh, but now we have a program. Not an able-bodied guy walking up to you. No, though. good heavens. Some of these guys look like they could be in the Olympics. <laughs> That's true. When you wrote this, what were you trying to accomplish with the book and did you do it? Did, were you nailing liberals for 30 years of social policy? What were you trying to say? I was trying to reveal the thinking behind that, the kinds of assumptions, the kind of world that exists inside their mind, and therefore why those assumptions are so dangerous in the long run. It's not just the policies mentioned in, those, in that, in that they book. They think they're better than everybody else. Oh, absolutely. There's no question. 
Uh, and that's what makes them dangerous. Uh, even all the policies that are mentioned there, 20 years from now, those policies may not be the policies we're concerned about. But that mindset will still be there. And what makes them tremendously dangerous is that facts that contradict what they believe are simply ignored or evaded. Where does the press fall into this as the United Group? Are they part of the United? Oh, absolutely. They're a major part of it because one of the reasons that people don't get many of the facts that go against what's believed is that the press doesn't choose to publicize those facts. Give me an example of something the press might not cover or cover well. Oh, a few years, a few years ago there was a story about um, prenatal care among blacks, that black women get less prenatal care than white women. The infant mortality rate is higher among blacks. They immediately assume that one causes the other. Now, I, now I, one of the things I like to do is go back to the original source and find out what it said. I went back. On the very same page where it said that, it sh the, the figures showed Mexican-Americans get even less prenatal care than blacks, and they have a lower infant mortality rate than whites. So infant mort prenatal care and infant mortality rate have nothing to do with each other. If you break it down further, uh, black women who have only a high school education but who are married, their children have lower infant mortality rates than white women who have a college education who are unwed mothers. So it's not race, it's not income, it's not education, it's lifestyle. When you live a certain way, there are consequences to that. The media doesn't want to, want, to, want to accept that. Because if you say people's lifestyles have a lot to do with the outcome, then there's no room for the anointed. Was the civil rights movement good for the African American in all ways, or were there any downsides to it? It was good in some ways. Uh, it was not, like most things, it's not good in all ways. It's a little like, um, you know, the, a clock that stopped will be right twice a day. And the liberals' assumptions worked in that particular case for a limited period. Unfortunately, along with that came many other things, which destroyed law enforcement, which destroyed the family, which destroyed education. And I don't think that the things that were gained outweighed that. Thomas Sowell, the book is The Vision of the Anointed. There it is on your screen, close up, go get it. Thank you, Thomas Sowell. Good luck with your book. I'm sure you enjoyed that. Uh, and I hope it piqued your interest so you check out the uh, audiobook. The link is in the description. You can listen to that right here on YouTube. Super easy. Just go ahead and click on the link. Also, share this content out so more people can learn about Thomas Sowell and his thinking. He's certainly just as relevant today as he ever was. Uh, thank you again for all your support. Um, if you use the Braze browser, please hit that little triangle and you can uh, show your appreciation that way. I also always have these great referral links. Uh, I, unfortunately, I had a very negative comment uh, about these links uh, not too long ago. You know, these are all things I use myself. It, it's great if you want to help support the channel and use them. No obligation, no pressure. I just find these to be very useful and just a great great deal um i love this american express uh amazon prime card they give you 125 dollar credit on your amazon account once you're approved you don't even have to spend a dollar on the card i just don't see any downside to that uh passing that along please use the referral link if you decide to take advantage of it coinbase 10 10 free dollars worth of uh, Bitcoin. Weeble, you get two free stocks if you open up a, a trading account and put $100 in. You get one free stock if you just open up the account. You know, how can you beat that? You don't have to put any money in. Uh, it's the best, smoothest, no fee trading platform I have ever seen. I love it. I use it every day. Uh, Celsius Network, if you already have some Bitcoin and you want to earn some interest on it or other uh, top cryptocurrencies, uh, there's a couple links in there for referral codes that should get you $40 in free Bitcoin. And I believe there's another one in there for 50. So, Hey, thanks again. Keep commenting, keep sharing, keep liking, get this content out here and we are going to do great. Thanks again.